Welcome back to Thread Dice Diaries with John and Hannah. I'm a little bit blurry eyed because I've been spending a number of hours converting our previous series of podcast episodes ready to upload to YouTube when I've got the time. But to cheer us up, we're going to answer some of your lovely voicemails. So without further ado, let's get cracking. And our first voicemail is from Jason of the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. Take it away, Jason. Hey, Hannah and John. Jason here. So interesting discussion on plot po- multiple plot point campaigns. It, this definitely goes back to the earliest days in the hobby. A lot of the old modules had faction play where you play factions against each other. Or like the Village of Hamlet, there's a ton of things you can do in there. So this definitely predates the article. The best game I've played in that made use of factions and multiple plot points was a black hat game that John was actually there at the original session. And Ian or um, Edwin or Spencer may weigh in. They were at more sessions than I was. But that went on for like a year. And that game was a drop-in, drop-out game. But because notes were kept online using Discord, you know, notes were kept. So even if you missed a session, you kind of see what's going on. So even though we had a ton of players, it was drop in, drop out, it worked really well with tons of different plot lines, tons of different factions. You know, the GM added uh, advanced levels basically to the Black Hack, where once you max out in character level, you move up to faction and then move up to leadership in different factions. But it was a really well-run game, and by far that was the best multi-plot point game I've ever played in. So looking forward to your next episode. Take care. Cheers for that, Jason. Um, yeah, thinking back on multiple thread games yeah. that I've played in that have really worked, um, generally, I can't think of many. A while ago, though, a friend ran a pre-written Deadlands scenario for us that was all set on, like, a train. Yes, yeah, yeah. And there were sort of various different passengers on the train. It stopped at various different places. And yeah, there was a lot it, going there on, wasn't Two there? or three different threads running through, and you could take sides in different ways, and it would have different outcomes. Yeah. I don't remember the name of the scenario, but I'm sure if any of our yeah. listeners like Deadlands, they'll be able to tell us. Yeah, I can't remember the name <laughs> of the scenario myself, but there was a lot going on in it. I mean, I think for myself, the... Um, the games I played in with most um, multiple plot lines, although I did play in the uh, the Black Hat game that Jason was talking about at the start, the the ones I can think of most readily tend to be like your World of Darkness or your slightly more modern style games, where there tends to be lots of plots and intrigue and stuff like that and things to do with your character backgrounds and stuff like that. Whereas I, I tend to like my D and D games a bit more sort of straightforward, you know. So. Yeah, it's something that's harder to pull off well in D&D without it becoming all confusing. Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong, if you've got a good gem, as Jason was saying there with the Black Hat game, you can do it. I just find that I've tended to experience it more in sort of slightly more modern or like futuristic games. I mean, we've we've spoke a lot about um, Scum and Villainy, where although you tend to do missions in that sort of like Power by the Apocalypse game, each game centers around like a mission or a heist that your sort of starship crew is doing in the background there's a lot there's rules for lots of different factions depending on what missions you do your relationship with them goes up or down and that affects what happens to you in the future so although that doesn't present in the same way i think that's probably a really good example of sort of faction play and uh, multiple plot lines and i know a lot of the sort of forge in the dark variants like band of blades and stuff tend to do that although a lot of the sort of multiple plot lines and how they work are sort of placed on the gm and these things tend to happen in the background and you only see a sort of a bit of it of the players but i don't say that's a bad thing it's just a different way of presenting it and it seems jason's got a little bit more to say so what else is on your mind jason i really wish most of the people i play with didn't listen to your podcast because i'd love to put some of these hanging tree ideas into practice but now i need to wait a year or two for people to kind of forget about your podcast because you guys came up some really great ones so congratulations on that so we've been talking on discord recently i'm curious you guys do a mix of sci-fi games and fantasy games hannah's got her star wars john has done you know um 
scum and villainy and stars without numbers. But a question has been talked about in Discord. Why do people prefer fantasy over sci-fi games? Why aren't sci-fi games more popular? Or actually, why aren't any genre but fantasy more popular? John can explain it better. But I'd be interested to hear you, you guys banner that back and forth. Um, anyhow, talk to you later. Star Wars? Star Wars, you heathen. I like Star Trek. And that might actually be the big sort of thing to underline. Because for me, Star Wars is fantasy. It's just fantasy that happens to be happening in space. You've got your magic and your sword fights and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Star Trek is about thinking things out and complex puzzles and big complicated ethical dilemmas it's all right jason i quite like star wars don't tell anna though i like star wars too it's dumb shit pew pew yeah. I, I, I do see Grand. what you, i do see what you mean i mean but it's not the same thing and fantasy is that thing of like something comfortable to go and relax in whereas sci-fi makes you do work yeah, I mean, I, I said this a bit online in the Discord conversation that uh, Jason's talking about, but I genuinely think that obviously part of the reason fantasy is more popular is because D and D was like the big name sort of RPG from back in the day, and that was mainly fantasy. Although the earlier versions of D and D were a bit more science fantasy, they had a few science fiction elements bleeding into them, but as they as it went on, they focused more purely on the fantasy, which is I'm assuming, I don't know, so don't quote me on this, is because that bit seemed more popular with people. So they went with what's popular, because obviously they're trying to sell their game, understandable. But um, I do think you're right, love, that um, fantasy is a bit more sort of comfortable. It's a bit more easy to envision, Mm -hmm. particularly when you're getting started on role-playing. It doesn't ask you to think hard about who's who, and I think that's why there's a lot of argument about like certain monsters representing certain groups and things at the minute because you're not really supposed to think that hard about it you're supposed to just go bad guys good guys we're the good guys we hit the bad guys they make a very satisfying thump and then we take their stuff and let's get in that dungeon and get that loot (laughs) whereas you are supposed to read into like who do this group of aliens represent or whatever yeah in a sci-fi and it's not to say that you can't tell those sorts of stories in fantasy and it's not to say that you can't tell Mm, dumb cheerful stories in science fiction but they tend to lean like that and that's probably why you play a sci-fi game with a group you know really well you play a fantasy game at a convention yeah I mean, you get I, what I mean, yeah. I mean, I think as well. Obviously, there's lots of different subgenres of fantasy, and there's lots of different subgenres of sci-fi. But I think all of the various subgenres of fantasy, in my opinion, are more closely aligned to each other than the different subgenres of sci-fi. So, for instance, if I take like swords and sorcery and your standard pseudo medieval, obviously there's differences, but there's also a lot of similarities. If you play like a burly barbarian with a sword in Sword and Sorcery, you can be a burly barbarian with a sword in your normal sort of pseudo-medieval fantasy. However, if I look at something like a Star Trek-style sci-fi, and then I look at like a sort of Blade Runner-esque like cyberpunk scenario, they seem far more distant to each other Mm. than the two fantasy genres do. And I think once we've all got a sort of grasp on that like sort of generic sort of pseudo medieval fantasy which let's face it most of us have because we've all seen fantasy films it's very easy to port that knowledge over into other subgenres of fantasy so you go all right okay i've got my idea in my character all right this subgenre we're playing in is a bit more grim and a bit more gritty i can easily adapt my character that's fine whereas if i'm like oh i want to play some like cybernetic up like a decker from like shadow run and you're like oh i'm running like an optimistic star trek federation Mm sci-fi i'm not saying i can't adapt that character but i'll have to do more work 
to adapt that character, as you were saying, love. So I, I think it's it's like fantasy as a genre for me, like in RPGs, is the equivalent of like a comfy pair of like slippers. It's like if you just want to relax and you just want to chill out, you don't have to worry about agonising or thinking too much about it, you just want to have a fun game, you can slide into a fantasy game and not have to worry too much about it. Whereas, much as I love sci-fi, and I do love sci-fi, and we've played lots of sci-fi RPGs, when I'm going into them, I have to like think a little bit more about it. And as Hannah was saying, that's a little bit less with Star Wars and things which are like blurring the line between science and fantasy, because if you want to play your sort of burly warrior with a sword, you could easily make it a Jedi or a mercenary in a Star Wars game. That's not difficult. Whereas if I'm going into another sci-fi game, I'm probably going to have to do more work to adapt the character idea. But this is also why some sci-fi tends to be more popular than others. Yeah, yeah. Um, and why some of it has sort of different reactions than others. Yeah. And it's about how much sort of fun stuff they put in compared to how much of that, like, highbrow, grey areas, political machinations and all yes. the rest. Yeah. So, for example, like, Farscape compared to Babylon 5. Farscape's yes. got a lot more of the sort of dumb spacey, spacey stuff. It's got a lot like, more Muppets, isn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, space battles and... Um, crazy heist scenarios and that kind of stuff that would all port really simply over to a fantasy world. And it's got Dargo in it, who's an amazing character. Whereas B5, I think, would take a lot more work to port over to a fantasy world, yes. in spite of the fact that like one of the races is very clearly space elves and one of the races is very clearly space orcs. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think as well, I think another aspect is uh, in a fantasy game the technology tends to be sort of either pseudo-medieval, and even if we don't know a lot about them, we all know what a sword is, we all know what a shield is, Mm -hmm. enough in terms to allow you to portray it in a game, and anything else, magic to do. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know exactly how magic works. It's fine. Whereas if you're in science fiction, obviously you can have magical and you have the force and stuff like that, but if you're talking about more sort of science-y science fiction, Mm -hmm. then there's a lot more of this technology and yeah you can as we talked about in that trek no babble episode we did ages ago mm. you can sort of waffle it away a bit to justify it but you still have to put some thought into how the technology works what sort yeah. of technology is available it's a lot easier to go oh magic did it than it is to go oh right so this science thing works by these actual engineering principles yeah. and then explain that to your group to enough of a degree that they can then pick up on whatever plot relevant thing it is that you're actually trying to get across to them yeah and i mean also the the technology can vary wildly between mm-hmm. different sci-fi subgenres because we, we know having watched a lot of star trek that in star trek they've got the transporters so you can beam yourself from one location to another and only like magnetic rock or like other plot things can interfere with it. But if you like rock up into another sci-fi game, are transporters available? What tech is available in that game? You're gonna have to find out what's available. Whereas if you're in a fantasy game, you're like, oh, I'm playing like a standard D and D fantasy setting. I've got a sword, a shield, and some armor. In most other sort of fantasy genres you go into, you're still gonna be able to get swords. You're still gonna be able to get shields. You're still gonna be able to get armor. So you don't have to. D- you don't have that extra cognitive load that you have to deal with. You can just relax and get on with it. Now, that's not to say that sci-fi games can't be rewarding, because they very much can be. And I love a good sci-fi game. As Jason was saying, we, we I've talked about Stars Without Number and Scum and Villainy a lot on the podcast. Really, really enjoyed them. But I think you do have to like put a bit of extra work in to get that reward out than you do in a fantasy game. I think part of it is it just depends on what you're in the mood for. If you're just looking for a quick game you can just sort of relax into and play with your friends, then I find that easier to do with a fantasy game. Now, I don't mind putting the extra effort in if I'm playing a different type of game, but you know, sometimes you just want to relax and just enjoy yourself and not have to worry about it. So I think that 
as well as why uh, as D&D having a sort of market prominence is probably the main reason that fantasy is a more popular genre thanks very much for your call Jason greatly appreciated and next up we have a call in from Randy at the Biggest Geekus podcast so take it away Randy I did a quick internet search. I could not find the hangman's tree um, anywhere in third edition. I think you're right. It wasn't Pathfinder, though. Um, that's interesting. Good monster. I really think it has a great vibe, and I think it's even used as a creature in Deadlands. I mean, because they, you know, hang in the hanging tree, and I thought that's really kind of cool. Uh, love the idea of the Wicker Man usage for it, and also the whole making cider and all the connectivity to the village and a strange village that brings brings adventurers in and say welcome yeah you don't know we're going to be a sacrifice uh keep up the good work really enjoyed uh enjoy your monster stuff um and you guys take care bye hi there randy thanks very much for the call in i'm glad that i wasn't just missing it in third air but it's interesting you mentioned deadlands i've just got my copy of deadlands reloaded for savage worlds here and i've pulled that out now whilst i couldn't find anything about the hanging tree as such there is the hanging judge as a monster Mm. in deadlands and these are five confederate circuit judges who formed a secret alliance to steal land ruin their rivals and all manner of unfortunate and evil things they were exposed and they were hauled to the nearest tree for a lynching. However, the Reckoners, the evil spirits that are sort of plaguing the Deadlands, seize the opportunity to infuse their spirits with evil unholy energy and return them back to Earth as walking abominations. They now stalk the West, terrorising people, and basically... Each night when they rise from the spirit realm, they decide on a series of random actions which they deem to be criminal for that night. And if they come across anyone performing those actions, they sentence them. And the sentence is always death. And they're pretty nasty creatures, you know. They can dodge, they can block, they get additional action cards, they ignore wound penalties... And they're pretty much immune to all damage unless you can find a way to like hang them. Which, yeah, good luck with that given that they're like massive, amazing marksmen. They've got scythes on their pistols. Their pistols are magic. They get all manner of like extra bonuses. However, if you do manage to destroy them, the coup you get, or the sort of the bonus you get from defeat them, is you get one of the judges like twin loading army revolvers that's like enchanted so that's pretty cool but like i say good luck finding them and getting hold of that so thank you very much for your call randy much appreciated and next up we have a few messages from joe over at the hindsightless podcast so we're going to play them and we'll chip in with our comments along the way so over to joe hey there you two uh yeah so I heard you mention to Jason about him having problems with SpeakPipe, and I also have problems using SpeakPipe on my phone, uh, which is why I still use Anchor. Sorry about that. I'm kind of a Luddite. But yeah, man, I just cannot get uh, SpeakPipe to work properly on my phone. It just shreds any sort of recording I try and make. Yeah, so keep making awesome episodes. Your monster episodes are amazing. I think they're so much fun. And the word for seeing patterns for humans putting patterns together is pareidolia, which is a fun word to say. Anyway, (laughs) have a good day. Take it easy. Peace out. Pareidolia. That's the one that's specifically seeing faces. Simulcra is when you're seeing stuff that's not a face, so like say the shape of a dog, and Simulcra Morty is when you see a skull. That's my favourite one. <laughs> yeah, and um, sorry about the the problems that you and other people have been having with SpeakPipe. I think it's mainly because it's not really configured to work with mobiles. It's more a website designed to be used with browsers, but. As you say, there are a couple of other ways that we can be contacted. We've still got to the old Anchor account. So if you type into Google Anchor Red Dice Diaries, then you'll get the old podcast, which will come up, which I mostly use to host the audio sort of files for the episodes of my OSE actual play 
campaign at the moment but you can still submit messages via that as joe has done and we will still get them and put them in our voicemail episodes or if you want to send us a slightly longer message because i think anchor only allows you like uh, a minute or something like that then you can save your message as an mp3 file or some sort of audio file and you can attach it to an email and send it to us at rdrpgpodcast at gmail.com and we'll still get that yeah we don't mind how you send us your messages we're just glad people are listening that's it call us whatever you want as long as you yep. call us <laughs> so let's see what else joe's got to say hey jana jana okay Apparently, that's your celebrity couple name now. <laughs> Holy shit. Hey, John and Hannah, it's Joe. And yeah, about the, fro- uh, uh, the frog hemoth, you were pretty much spot on when you were talking about the Pathfinder stuff. Having a plus 22 in stealth for a monster that big is nuts at that level. That's super, super high. Uh, for a regular, like, CR... 13 like 13th level creature a plus 22 uh for like something the size of a human not out of the line but for something that huge yeah that is that's crazy because they're taking being that big they're probably getting a minus eight at least to their stealth and so you know they're actually sitting on like a plus 30 but because of the penalty they're only at a plus 22 so great stuff keep it up talk to you soon peace out yeah, that's pretty much what I thought, Joe, to be honest. Although, as I say, it's been ages since I've played 3.5 and I've I've only really played like one Pathfinder game, which didn't last very long. So I'm not sure of the sort of power scales of it. But I thought that 22 stealth seemed a little bit OTT for such a big creature. And as for the Jonna thing, we've been called worse. Yeah, I've been, I've been called far worse <laughs> in my time, man. So go on. Although, interestingly enough, as a bit of an aside, one thing I have noticed is because on like, um, my Facebook and whatever, I'm down as like John Allen Large, and I've noticed like a lot of people, particularly Americans, either refer to me as John Allen or just to straight Allen when they first meet me, which I always thought was <laughs> slightly odd, but may- maybe it's a thing over there. I don't know. Let me know, American <laughs> peeps out there listening. But either way, as we said in the, the previous response... L- long as you're not being insulting, I'm not bothered if you get my name wrong. It's absolutely fine. I had a cousin who didn't spell my name right for like the first 15 years of my life, so I'm pretty sure I can handle it. And you know, I don't mind having a celebrity couple name for myself and Hannah while we're doing the podcast. It's all fine by me. Uh, late on this one, but I wanted to call in before I forgot uh, about the hangman tree. So yeah, it is in Pathfinder. They call it a gallows tree because it might have been one of those like proprietary names that Pathfinder couldn't take when they started Pat with that Paizo couldn't take when they started Pathfinder. So they call it a gallows tree and it's a pretty high level monster CR 13. So pretty high upper tier level play. It's got a bucket of hit points, 218. It's got an armor class of 24, which, you know, you think it'd be pretty easy to hit a big tree, but maybe not. It's got a bunch of, uh, slam attacks. So basically like it's branches, it can, punch you with its branches and then grab you and then hang you. It's one of my favorite monsters that I've never really used, but it was crazy when you talked about it because I love them. So anyway, thanks for that. Peace out. Yeah, cheers for that one. It's always uh, good to have the extra info from Pathfinder when we've not been able to find it. We always like hearing about other ones. Yeah, and I mean, obviously we've we've got a sort of fairly substantial collection of books but it's not limitless. So especially when we're doing these slightly more sort of left field monsters, there's inevitably going to be times where we've not got the books to cover Mm -hmm. every single eventuality, but it's really cool to hear you guys coming in and telling us about the ones that we've either not got access to or we've missed. So thanks very much, guys. Super awesome to hear one of Hannah's RPG bugbears. Really great stuff. I hear you about the harmfulness of the tropes. You know, like, I've never really gone in for the tropes in my when I'm running games, and I almost feel that I'm in a way doing a disservice, because you can't, like... <laughs> 
subvert the tropes if you never introduce the tropes in the first place. You know, if I, yeah, I've had several older women in my games that are not witches. Uh, and I feel like if I did make one an actual witch, it would trick everybody because <laughs> they're just so used to like me not going with the standard trope. So I don't know, you know, I, it's just one of those weird things. Like I feel sort of bad for my players that they aren't super familiar with all these old RPG tropes. Anyway, great stuff. Always awesome. Peace out. Thanks very much, Joe. And yeah, I've got to say, as we mentioned it in the episode, part of Hannah's loathing of that particular trope is I think partly because I've been so conditioned by sort of like encountering it in so many games <laughs> that like whenever we play in a game together, which unfortunately doesn't happen as often as we'd like due to our work schedules, whenever we're in a fantasy setting and someone describes like an old bent over crown with like a hook nose, like hobbling towards you, my brain instantly goes, burp, burp, burp. it's a witch, abort, abort, abort. And, like, that's it. I think that's been sort of, like, conditioned into me, like, you know, like some sort of mental programming over the years. And I've tried to get away from it but and not be quite so overt with it, but uh, it, it is a difficult thing. Once it's lodged in your brain, it's a difficult thing to shake. And I do want to point out again that I don't have any problem with anyone using these sorts of things in their game in any capacity. I just wanted to underline one that really annoys me personally because I've encountered it so often. And I'm sure everybody has like little things that annoy them. That's why we do the ba- the gaming bugbears. Yeah, and I think, as we were saying about there's nothing wrong with using these tropes, but if that if that trope is all you've got and there's no more to it, so it's just like old woman equals evil witch and that's all there is... Okay, yeah, if you're just doing it as a throwaway encounter, maybe that's fine. But if you wanted it to be a bit more, it's just a little bit flat and one-dimensional, which is fine if that's what you're after. But we were trying to highlight in the episode that you, if you think about it a little bit and you put a little bit of time to develop it, you could do so much more with that trope, whether it's subverting it, expanding on it, but you could do a lot more with it and add a lot more to your game than simple old woman equals witch. And this is sort of coming back to that thing we were saying earlier about fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah. If you want a big, dumb encounter where there's a nice old lady and she offers you some gingerbread and then she turns out to be a witch, go for it. Have fun. Oh, man, I love gingerbread. (laughs) But if you want to put a bit more thought into it, you can get a more interesting story out of your game. Yeah, and I think that's all we're trying to do with these episodes, these like monster episodes and the sort of bugbear episodes, is rather than just saying, like, no, this is bad or no, you shouldn't do that, which we don't want to do because, like, your game's your game. We don't know how it's run. We don't have your group of players. All we're trying to say is if you do want to do something more with it or develop it or make something else out of it, here's some suggestions and some ideas that you can take away. Whether you ignore them, whether you go with them, or whether you come with your own ideas, that's all grand. All we're trying to do is sort of like spur people on to like maybe give it a little bit more thought and hopefully enrich your game. Yeah, we're, we're just a couple of middle-aged nerds who like role play, and we talk about it and we happen to record those conversations and stick them on the internet. <laughs> We're mid- not telling anybody how to run their games. Are you middle-aged? How old's middle-aged now? I know I'm definitely middle-aged, but I think you've got I'm a few close years. close enough to you. I think you've got a few years left, haven't you? I'm definitely middle-aged. I mean, I've got the flat cap and the slippers to prove it, so... I just remembered one more cool thing about the gallows tree from Pathfinder is if it kills a medium or large creature... Uh, anything smaller it'll just leave but if it kills a medium or large creature it'll rip out all of its organs and dissolve them into the root system and fill them with like this greenish sappy polleny kind of grossness and then a couple days later that creature rises as a gallow tree zombie which are just like a kind of a more vicious form of zombie and that rules like that makes them kind of a more viable threat for a campaign because obviously the tree's not going to move around unless we're talking about, you know, the kind of tree monsters you were sort of talking about the Cthulhu, Cthulhu ones, the 
Dark Young of Shub Nagatheroff, however the hell you say that. Anyway, just some more fun stuff about Gallo Trees. Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. I love the sound of this tree creating these gallows zombies. And I'm a big fan of any of these sort of like monster spawning creatures. Because let's face it, in a lot of games, there's a lot of monsters wandering around and not really much reason for them being where they are. So I love having these creatures that spawn other monsters because you want to put a load of undead in your game. Oh, there's a gallows tree here. It's spawning all these zombies. That's where they're coming from. And that also gives the PCs a way, once they've unraveled that, to then sort of stem the tide of undead by like going to the source and taking out the mm-hmm. gallows tree rather than just like trying to kill every single undead in your campaign world. So I, I really love things like that because it puts like a little bit of a mystery and rewards investigation. So yeah, you could just like blast your way through all the undead and like kill them all with your feats and your combat and whatever. Or but if you've got a player who maybe wants to investigate a bit maybe like a wizard or a sage or something like that, and they poke around in the local legends, find out what the crack is, find out where these undead are coming from, then it rewards that in play. There's sort of like a ready-made mystery and investigation like Hook already in that monster. So I absolutely love that, dude. It's always nice to have monsters that like work together as a group. Yes, definitely. Or at least have reason to all be in the same adventure. Yeah. So, thank you very much to all our wonderful callers for calling in. We had Jason of the Nerds RPG Variety Cast, Randy of the Biggest Geekers Podcast, and last but by no means least, we had Joe of the Hindsightless Podcast. Great podcasts all. Thoroughly recommend you give those a listen. If you'd like to get in touch with us about anything, maybe feature in a future post-bag show, then there's a few different ways you can do it. You can leave us a voicemail on SpeakPipe. There'll be a link in the description below. As I said earlier in this episode, if you're having a problem with that, you can also leave us a voicemail on Anchor. Again, I'll put the link in the description below for that. You Or you can attach an audio file or send us an old-fashioned text email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com until we speak to you next time take care stay safe and whatever you're playing have fun bye